Okay, and that will keep going until, and that will keep going and keep growing until we get to this point where for tax purposes at time 10, you've already had all the deductions happen. So you've had all $200,000 as a tax deduction, but you've only had $100,000 of the depreciation expense. So the carrying value at time 10 of the asset is $100,000. And you can see zero to $100,000, that tax, that temporary difference is 100. When we get to time 20, this has stayed at zero the whole time, but this is back down at zero and we end up with a temporary difference of zero. So what we started with was 200 and 200, temporary difference of zero. We got to a peak at time 10 of $100,000 temporary difference and we ended up back down at zero. So most assets exhibit that sort of function in relation to their temp uh, deferred, um, in this case, it's gonna be a deferred tax liability. But the temporary, let's just focus on the temporary differences. The temporary differences increase to $100,000 and drop away. Um, now, generally in practice, that's not gonna, you're not gonna see a total happen like that because what's gonna happen is the next year or two years later, they might invest more in property, plant, and equipment. And so you start having more depreciation. And if you keep investing in property, plant, and equipment over and over and over, this just keeps building and you never actually stop and see that downward spot, that, that downward section. Um, and if you don't believe me and we don't have time to do it here, go away and sort of set one of these up on Excel, set up a function so that you're buying a new asset every every two years and just graph out how the temporary differences work and it will just keep growing. It never actually stops. It gets even worse if the, the assets themselves are actually increasing in value because, well, the cost of a new one is higher than the previous one because it's just gonna inflate even further. So these actually arguably never go away, um, which is one of the issues which we'll come back to right at the end of, end of the class. So we have a temporary difference and we multiply that temporary difference by 30% gives you $3,000. Now in this case, if you look back at what an asset does, the tax base is less than the carrying value and that's gonna give rise to a DTL. So when you see in the example that you've got there, if the opening balance was zero, you debit tax expense $3,000, you credit deferred tax liability $3,000 and that's all that you need to do. Um, so for turning out liabilities, which is the other side of things, the tax base of a liability is, if it's the tax base of a liability is less than the carrying amount of a liability, you end up with a DTA. If the tax base of liability is greater than the carrying amount, you end up with a DTL. Now, the thing is, if you think back, and if you've got any slides in front of you, think about what the definition or how to calculate the tax base of a deferred ta of a liability is. It starts with the carrying value and takes stuff away. So unless what you're taking away is negative, and I can't see how you can have a negative deduction for something, but I could be proven wrong. If you're starting with the carrying value and taking stuff away, you can never end up with a situation where the tax base is greater than the carrying amount. I just, I, I've never come across one. There may well be something out in practice, but I haven't seen it. So reality is the tax base of a liability is always gonna be less than the carrying amount of a liability. Again, I could be wrong, but I haven't seen anything where that's not been the case. 95 to 100, well, 100% 100 of the time, you can be pretty much sure that a liability, if there's a temporary difference, you're gonna end up with a DTA. And that also means on the flip side, if you forget all of this, if you have, a, if you have an asset, if it's got a temporary difference, 95% of the time, it's gonna be a DTL that you end up with. Um, the example for this we've done, we actually talked about just before. So long service leave liability, we've got $50,000 sitting there. Uh, we've worked out the tax base of zero. We know it gives rise to a $15,000 um, deferred, deferred tax something, and it's gonna be a deferred tax asset um, because it's, we're gonna be paying less tax in the future. This is a deductible temporary difference and that's 
is going to be a positive thing for us. So we debit deferred tax assets by 15,000 and we credit tax expense by 15,000. So the amount of your tax expense actually drops. Now, there is a lot of text on this and I'm not going to read it all out. Um, but it's useful to note, if you've got a deferred tax asset sitting there, so the long service leave example, we've got $50,000 of long service leave provision. When we pay it, we get a tax deduction. Now, you can only claim, and some of you guys may be aware of this if you've done tax law, but you can only claim a tax deduction if you've got profit to claim it against. Um, you're not going to be able to do it against something where it's not, there's not going to be profit there. So you can only utilize that um, if there are taxable profits that you can utilize it against. So what this is saying and what paragraph 56 looks at is you basically can impair that asset if you don't think or the company doesn't think that it's probable that sufficient taxable profit will exist. So if you see a company starting to impair their deferred tax assets, that's a really bad sign. Because what that's telling you is that this company doesn't think it's actually going to make any profits or any taxable profits in the future. Um, that's not a good thing. So if you wanted a red flag, that would absolutely be it. Okay. Now in the same vein, I thought for this week, and we, we didn't do it last week, and I can't remember if we did it the week before, but there's been a lot of, I suppose there's been over the last 12 to 18 months, a lot of chatter about multinationals not paying enough tax. I mean, Google has been hit up for it in Australia. Um, Apple has been hit up for it. I mean, I'd imagine most of you probably have iTunes accounts. So maybe not, maybe you're all ripping it free off the web, who knows. Um, but I've got an Australian iTunes account. I buy something, the, the overall Apple is obviously an American company. When I'm buying tracks online, they're actually coming from Ireland. That's where the revenue is getting, that's where a lot of the taxation is occurring. They're all, a lot of these multinationals are figuring out places to house their operations so that they can, f they can basically pay as little tax as possible. Why set your operations up in Australia, which is a 30% tax rate, when you can find somewhere else which has got a much cheaper tax rate out there? Um, now, what we're going to be looking at today is actually not, I suppose, a service industry company. It obviously sells actual things. Um, I've unfortunately spent far too long in one of these stores, or actually a number of these stores around the world over the last 12 months, and it's, I don't know, I just, horrible places. But, you know, we kind of need to do it. So what I'm talking about is the IKEA Proprietary Limited, which is the Australian company. Now, they're, all of these are private, um, all these companies are private. They don't actually have to provide their financials, but in 2010, they actually opened up the doors and said, they're going to give us some information about what's going on. And it was really interesting what was happening. That may be not the best font, but their revenue in 2010 for, for Australia was over half a billion dollars. And they've only got like three or four stores. I mean, there's a lot of traffic going through all of them. Their profit before tax was under 10 million. So even as a rough, like just rough rule of thumb looking at that, $10 million on half a billion dollars, what's that, 2% thereabouts? Like it's not exactly a great profit margin, um, which is really weird because when you see all those current affairs type shows and today to nights, and I know they've had specials on Ikea where they've said, well, you know, you can buy a Billy bookcase in Australia and it costs you a hundred bucks, you go overseas and, and the sa exactly the same thing, even with FX differences will cost you 60. Um, so we do pay more for it. And even with all of that, they're not making really any money, which is in comparison to their parent company, um, INGKA Holding, which globally in that year made about $32 billion, $33 billion in sales and had a profit after tax of close to $4 billion. So you're looking, again, back at the envelope calculation, what is it, 10-ish, well, maybe 11, 12%, which is way better than what they're getting in Australia. Now, to me, there's something going on. There is something going on there. There's even some related party issues where IKEA pays whether it's a franchise, I think it's a franchise fee to these guys, they're 100% owned by them and that's coming off their profitability. 
So why are they paying, you know, if you've done ABC, if you're looking at, this is probably a little bit more ABC related, but, you know, should that not be sort of unwound? Why, is, why are they doing that? You could argue that they're trying to get as much profit out of Australia because we have quite a high corporate tax rate. And that is arguably what's going on. The areas where these guys are operating have, do have lower tax rates than what Australia do. And the final wrinkle into all of this is INGKA Holding is owned by Stichting INGKA Foundation. The really, one, the first part of that is IKEA is now not even a Swedish company. IKEA is owned, like, ultimately its parent is Dutch. And the second thing which is really interesting about this whole thing is it's a charity. It's not even like just a normal standard corporation. It is owned ultimately by a charitable foundation. Um, now, I don't know the ins and outs of Dutch charitable foundation tax rules, but I'd imagine that they probably have some tax benefits from being set up like that. I could be wrong, but I'd hazard that's probably the case. Um, and this is a growing problem. I mean, not just IKEA. I'm sort of picking on them just because I had some information about them. But it's not just IKEA. This is a growing issue with multinationals around the world of just moving profits and moving taxable income around the place. Um, you know, how it gets solved, I have no idea because that's a, it's a really hard problem to deal with. But it is causing a big issue for countries where they're just moving operations to get things into lower tax jurisdictions. But on that note, I'll leave it on that. But on that note, we'll take a break for a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, want to come and say hi? Please do. Otherwise, feel free to stretch your legs. <laughs>